I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, two rockets are fired into southern Israel. The Israeli government accuses Iran of undermining Saudi Arabia, and basketball fans get ready to start rooting for a whole new team because an Israeli NBA star is on the move. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. Israeli defense officials have just confirmed that two rockets were fired from the Sinai Peninsula into open space in southern Israel this morning. No injuries or damages were caused because the missile smashed into an open area. The nation's red alert air raid siren wasn't sounded after it was determined the projectiles were headed toward a non-populated area. No group has yet claimed responsibility for the attack, although earlier in the month, the Islamic State-affiliated Sinai Province terror group took credit for four rockets launched at the Israeli city of Eilat from the peninsula, which is a hotbed of an extremist insurgency. Today's attack also comes just one day after the province terrorists accused the Israeli army of killing four of its members in a drone strike as they traveled in a car driving along the Jewish state's border with Egypt. The IDF hasn't confirmed or denied the report, which is consistent with its policy of withholding comment on incidents occurring outside of Israel. The Israeli Prime Minister is feeling triumphant since his successful first White House meeting with U.S. President Donald Trump. In fact, he's even borrowing a phrase from the Republican leader to describe the summit, saying that a new day has dawned on Israeli-American relations. During his first briefing to the Israeli cabinet since returning to Jerusalem, the premier updated his ministers on all important talks in the Oval Office. Netanyahu says the two leaders reached consensus on a number of hot-button issues, including further Israeli settlement construction in the West Bank. <laughs> בתחום של הטכנולוגיה, בתחום של הכלכלה, בתחומים רבים אחרים. וכן, הסכמנו להקים גם צוות במקום שעדיין לא הסכמנו אליו, לא הגענו אליו להסכמה, אני מתכוון כמובן לנושא ה... At a joint news conference with Netanyahu in Washington, Trump publicly urged the Israeli leader to curb settlement construction. But the new president also backed away from a U.S. commitment to a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which has been the long-standing bedrock of Washington's Middle East policy. Far-right members of Netanyahu's coalition have been emboldened by Trump's suggestion that he's open to new ways to achieve peace, not necessarily entailing the creation of a Palestinian state that's been considered a benchmark of American policy for decades. I have to say that in the end of the meeting with the President, he defined the relationship between Israel and the United States as a new day, a new day. More details are now emerging about the secret peace talks that Israel held exactly a year ago, including controversial reports that the Israeli Prime Minister offered to halt all building outside of the major settlement blocks in exchange for a treaty with the Palestinians. We all know by now, of course, that the secret summit failed to yield any breakthroughs. But there's already ramifications from continuing reports of exactly what was on the table. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu's already confirmed his presence at the February 21, 2016 talks, which included Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, Jordan's King Abdullah, and U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry. The negotiations were based on the two-state solution and Arab recognition of Israel as a Jewish state. Netanyahu also reportedly asked Washington to officially recognize the large settlement blocks as Israeli in exchange for his proposed freeze, and presented a five-step plan for a wider regional peace initiative. Israeli lawmakers across the political spectrum are now criticizing the premier for withdrawing from the negotiations, which he's believed to have blamed on opposition from his right-wing government. 
Meanwhile, another new report causing backlash today includes allegations the premier may have to take back his pledge to build a new settlement in the West Bank to compensate residents of the illegal outpost of Amona after they were evicted earlier this month. The backtrack is apparently linked to the request from U.S. President Donald Trump that Israel hold back on settlement construction. Netanyahu said to have explained to his cabinet that in actual terms, there won't be a complete freeze, but more likely a slowdown in West Bank construction. In their recent meeting in the White House, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu bent over backwards to please U.S. President Donald Trump. That's at least the view of Times of Israel editor David Horowitz, who sat down with ILTV's Steve Leibowitz to share his concern about the new Israeli-American relationship. Uh, Trump seemed to indicate we don't want you to build any new settlement. He seemed to indicate that he doesn't care, one state, two state, whatever you guys agree on, whatever. Uh, but he also uh, indicated that there is a, a, a move underway behind the scenes uh, for a, a new peace initiative that is a regional peace initiative. Are any of those serious policy declarations per se? So the, you know, the notion that um, shared concern about Iran in this part of the world will bring together unlikely, previously unlikely alliances between the likes of Israel and the Saudis and the Gulf states and Egypt and so on. This is a, a, a firmly held belief by Netanyahu for some time. I mean, Netanyahu's feeling is that um, the, the, the quote-unquote moderate Sunni states look to the United States to be the powerhouse in the Middle East, have been disappointed in recent years and therefore have looked to Israel as the next best thing capable of standing up to, to Iran and its various proxies and, and, uh, uh, and allies and so on. Um, and Netanyahu believes that this can be used to maybe also chivy the Palestinians towards uh, greater compromise. Uh, it seemed to me that at the press conference, Trump had been wanting to be the one who would say this and got, was a little, just a little bit tetchy there that Netanyahu had kind of said it first. You know, I didn't know you were going to talk about that and then sort of elaborated on it. You know, this is a, a Netanyahu belief that the president is open to. I think what's, what's common to, to the raising of that issue and the one state, two state thing is that Trump is not going to be Obama-ish or Clinton-esque and maybe even Bush-like to some extent in terms of deep familiarity with all of the nuances of any effort at peacemaking. I don't think the one, I think the one state, two state thing was misinterpreted by people who would, who would, I mean, people have their reasons why they see things in a certain way. This was not Trump endorsing a one-state solution or, or ending the two-state solution. It was Trump saying, I don't know, and I don't care. Whatever you guys want to do is fine by me. I would like to try and get a deal. I think it was incumbent on Netanyahu to make clear, well, actually, a one-state solution is not acceptable to us. We were revived on the basis of a two-state solution. We want to keep a Jewish democratic Israel. We need to separate from lots of hostile people here. For decades, we've been waiting for the Palestinians to genuinely endorse a two-state solution in which Israel is a Jewish state as opposed to one flooded with millions of refugees. I think that was a missed opportunity, and I don't think it needed to have been done in a confrontational way. I'm sorry that Netanyahu didn't, didn't make that clear, and that's partly because of his domestic coalition considerations back home. But the, re the idea of, of, of regional pro progress, you know, I don't know. Clearly, th some things have changed. Uh, you know, Saudi generals did not used to come to Jerusalem and send out photographs meeting with Knesset members. So, you know, th things have moved behind the scenes. From there to some kind of real possibility of dramatic progress towards public peace agreements and so on is a very, very long journey. And to my mind, requires changing the mindset in lots of these countries. I mean, the Saudi leadership may be so concerned about Iran that it has contacts with Israel that it didn't have before. But the Saudi public or the Egyptian public, I mean, the relationship between Netanyahu and Sisi, I think, is probably pretty close. That does not mean that the Egyptian public is, you know, is, is going to be supportive of, of warm, warmer ties with Israel. Uh, so that there would need to be a much, a much more fundamental process of education and changing what's taught and what's, what's, what's broadcast in media in these countries for the leaderships to be able to do anything remotely public, in my opinion. Now, this story is a bit out of the ordinary. Israel's defense minister, Avigdor Lieberman, is accusing Iran of trying to undermine Saudi Arabia in the Middle East and is now calling for the creation of a dialogue with the Sunni Arab states, all in an effort to defeat radical elements in the region. 
The Israeli defense chief made the statements at the Munich Security Conference on world leaders, who gather annually to discuss imperative international concerns. Lieberman told the delegates that Tehran's goal is to upset the stability in every country across the Middle East, but particularly in Riyadh. The second challenge, uh, it's uh, of course their efforts to undermine stability in every country in the Middle East. We can start with Bahrain, from Bahrain to Yemen, from Yemen to Lebanon, from Lebanon to Syria. And uh, I think that, uh, of course, their main destination is, uh, at the end of the day, it's Saudi Arabia. And I will be happy to hear my colleague, or Minister of Foreign Affairs of Saudi Arabia. Lieberman is also comparing Tehran's record of rogue nuclear activity with Pyongyang's. The Iranian deal, it's copy-paste what we had with uh, North Korea. And we'll see what the results in North Korea. And no doubts, if you ask every people, every man, every woman in the Middle East, everybody understands that Iran will be another example of North Korean deal. Earlier this month, the defiant Kim Jong-un regime conducted the testing of an intermediate-range ballistic missile in its first direct challenge to the international community since U.S. President Donald Trump took office on January 20th. Israeli Defense Minister Lieberman asked for a response from Saudi Arabia's foreign minister, and he certainly got one. The kingdom's message about the possibilities of regional peace are far more positive than most might imagine, and ILTV's Aaron Porras has more on the story. Aaron, why are the Israeli leaders so excited? Well, I, want, I will get into that answer in my report. But the short story is that Israeli relations with our neighboring Arab countries has markedly improved. Uh, and it's breathing new life and hope into the infamously stalemate situation that we have going on in the Middle East right now. During his own remarks at the Munich Security Conference, Saudi Arabia's top diplomatic envoy Adel al jaber expressed optimism that Arabs and Israelis can reach a peace deal this year. After pledging the support of his and other Arab states in negotiating such an accord, he stressed that both Jerusalem and Ramallah must have the political will to do so. Al Jubeir also voiced strong praise for the new United States administration, saying that U.S. President Trump's pragmatism and business-oriented problem-solving attitude may help to resolve other regional challenges. The Saudi diplomat also outlined his nation's shared objectives with the United States, such as destroying the Islamic State and containing Iran. And in related news, Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi has just described the achievement of an Israeli-Palestinian peace treaty as, quote, one of his own top priorities, end quote. The Arab leader made the claim during a meeting with leaders representing the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations just ahead of their current annual mission to Jerusalem that's taking place now. The former Egyptian army general added that reaching a peace deal would remove the main impetus behind Palestinian terror attacks against Israelis. Sisi's comments come on the heels of a breaking report of Cairo's participation in failed secret attempts with Jerusalem, Washington, and Amman last year to secure a similar peace deal. The Israeli army is now advancing a pilot project to put female soldiers at the steering wheels of the nation's tank battalions. Any of the young women who've expressed an interest in becoming combat soldiers will be eligible to sign up for duty in the Armored Corps, once an actual date for the project's launching has been set. Army officials say they're trying to remain above a storm of criticism that erupted after news of the plan became public a few months ago, ranging from skepticism over the women's abilities to navigate the heavy equipment to rabbinical concern over their serving in close quarters with their male counterparts. But the program's moving ahead anyway as the Israeli Defense Forces explore new options for the 38% of the nation's young female recruits who say they want to perform their compulsory military service in combat. The 4th Mixed Gender Battalion is set to begin operations next month in the Jordan Valley entrusted with defending the country's borders. Late Israeli President Shimon Peres passed away in September of 2016, but his legacy lives on through the many good works of the peace center he founded in his name. Our next story is about 16 deaf Palestinian children from the West Bank and the Gaza Strip who can now hear for the very first time, all thanks to a project sponsored by the center. 
All of the Palestinian children have been given cochlear implants during surgery performed at a Jerusalem hospital. The operations to repair the children's hearing have all been carried out over the past few months, including six during the past couple of days, all courtesy of the Jewish state. Israel's defense ministry has even played a part by authorizing travel permits for the children to be brought in for treatment from the Palestinian territories, including Gaza, run by radical Islamist Hamas leaders. Dr. Michal Kaufman performed all of the restorative surgeries. She told the Ynet News Service that her young patients were completely incapable of communicating before the procedures and expressed joy that Israel has been able to contribute to such a dramatic change for them. She says the Paris Center for Peace program is amazing for helping the children to step out of their world of silence to live fully normal lives in the future. As our dependence on digital technology increases, so does a demand for ways to efficiently cope with the massive amount of digital data we use. Our guest today is Ariel Sobelman, the Vice President of Corporate Alliances for the Israeli-based company Valens, which has created a device called the HD Base T that's capable of transferring large amounts of information across a single cable. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. All right, so to begin, we understand that this technology has recently been awarded an Emmy for Achievement in Engineering, so congratulations. What does it do exactly? Right, so HD Base T is actually a, a large ecosystem. It's a transport, a data transport technology, which really drives huge quantities of data across very simple infrastructure. That's really the holy grail of the industry, is to try and drive more and more data across cheaper and cheaper infrastructure. It works in TVs at homes, it works in, in industry installations, it works in cars and airplanes, everything. That's there's so much data that has to go through the world, and the, and the industry has to find cheaper ways uh, to drive it efficiently. That's basically what HD Base T is about. Absolutely. Now, this, this is very interesting because I understand that you've now signed on with Mercedes and GM. Um, so what are the applications for this technology in other industries, especially in the automotive world? Right. So HD Base T historically was a connectivity technology to drive video and audio and data across all kinds of applications. So it started from TVs, and that's really why the Emmy Award was awarded, because it changed the way people viewed TVs and how people built TVs. Right. But over time, we realized that there are additional applications. Um, all this data and all these cameras and sensors really are changing the automotive world, and all these cars are going to start driving on their own, the autonomous car vision. And basically how they drive is through driving huge amounts of data that the cars pick up from around the highways, right? There are cameras and sensors and lasers and all kinds of things. And all this data has to be efficiently driven to the brain, to the central processing unit of the car, uh, so it can make decisions, turn left, turn right, brake the car, speed up, etc. All this needs a, con a connectivity infrastructure. And you guys have this technology. Correct. And suddenly it was like a perfect storm for us. Yeah, I mean, this is really exciting, too, because obviously the autonomous car systems that, that we're hearing about, it sounds outlandish. And Tel Aviv was actually recently tapped to be host for an autonomous car system, which is a big deal. Are you guys playing a role in this project? Yeah, so, so we're involved in, all, in a, lot of, a lot of automobile and automotive projects around the world. And there are a lot of cities that are trying to pilot autonomous driving uh, test systems. Uh, there's, there's some in Philadelphia and there's some in California. A lot of these systems are driving and there are larger and larger fleets. They're doing uh, massive experiments, really, of driving without any drivers. Um, and Tel Aviv is like a hub of this kind of technology, so we're going to be seeing a lot of that happening here. And HD Base T hopefully will be in a lot of cars to be supporting these kind of uh, applications. Now, you know, there are dangers that, that exist within the autonomous car system. I mean, can, can your car get hacked in any way? Is that something that you guys deal with? That, that's actually a great question. It's like, it's, it's one of the most uh, frequent questions that people hear. Obviously, things that are connected to the internet or are connected to some kind of network, they come with a risk of, uh, of, of hacking them. And with cars, it's kind of scary because, you know, bad things can happen if somebody hacks them. Yeah, I don't want somebody them. to take the wheel without me knowing. Right. right. So basically, as part of HD Base T, we're actually very involved with a lot of security companies and uh, and, and the HD Base T technology and standard will be dealing with, with the security issues as well to assure that these kind of technologies are, uh, are safe for everyone. Now, what inspired you guys to create this technology? It's very interesting. So, so really it came from uh, the, the original founders of the company. It came from a world in which 
Uh, everyone was familiar with the use case that you had a TV hanging up in your living room and this huge braid of cable, cables just dangling down that looked pretty ugly. People had no idea what to do with it. Yeah. And like, it just made your living room look ugly. So, and then they're saying, wow, you know, we can have all this data, uncompressed, Great quality on one cable. I'm telling you, a studio cable. would want this. Even right. The, right, the TV industry. And there are a lot of studios yeah. that use this technology, a lot of them. It helps like uh, expand the distance and, and drive very high quality video and way cheaper infrastructure. So and studios it's more use it all the for time. Everybody. I mean, Correct, it helps the world. We change the world. Absolutely. So, I mean, the big question now is what is next for you guys? I'm sure there's a lot of plans. So I think there, there are so many exciting applications where HDBC can be used. For Right now, we're focusing on the automotive one. It's such a huge opportunity. The automotive world is just changing radically. I mean, 10 years from now, our kids probably won't need driver license anymore. And if not, them, our grandkids. But that, that's, that's where the world is going to. So to be part of such a massive, exciting uh, uh, transformation, paradigm shift in the world is just like a great experience. And we're really happy that, we're, that we're, we have the technology to play in this field. Well, congratulations on what you've created, and I'm excited to see how it continues to change different industries, whether that's the automotive industry, the TV industry. I know our studio is now probably going to be looking into this technology. Come talk to us. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. All right, speaking of autonomous cars, I'm not sure that Israeli drivers could ever be described as the best in the world, but it's certainly fair to say that Israel has proved its worth when it comes to developing world-changing technologies. Now, expertise from the Jewish state is helping New Yorkers avoid deadly dangers on the road. ILTV's Aaron Porras returns to the studio with a scoop on the story. Aaron? Thank you, Natasha. Yes, the uh, Jerusalem-based company Mobileye has just installed its innovative collision avoidance system on 4,500 cars in the system or in the city. I'm sorry. The cutting-edge fleet is operated by ride-sharing companies, uh, whose services are available through apps like Uber and Lyft. Mobileye specializes in the development of advanced vision and driver assistance systems. Because its sensors are able to identify potential dangers in real time, drivers are given alerts about looming potential collisions in time to react and continue safely on their way. The Israeli company says that as car sharing becomes increasingly popular, it's hoping its technology will provide passengers with an extra layer of protection and even possibly improve the driver's performance. This latest success follows the Israeli firm's recent signing of a partnership deal with the United States Department of Transportation. It's also launched a number of other safety pilot programs in the U.S., including the outfitting of public buses with its vision sensors. So the next time you're riding in a car for hire or on a bus, you never know, but it might be Israeli technology that ensures you'll be reaching your destination in one piece. Listen up, Israeli basketball fans. It might be time to start rooting for a new NBA team because Israeli basketball star Omri Kaspi has just been traded. The star athlete became the first ever Israeli to join the NBA in 2009 and has been playing for the Sacramento Kings since 2014. Now he's headed to New Orleans to join the Pelicans after having been traded in exchange for Tyreek Evans. This isn't Kaspi's first time moving teams in the NBA. In fact, he's already made the rounds through the Sacramento Kings, the Cleveland Cavaliers, and the Houston Rockets. In July of 2014, he was actually traded to the Pelicans as part of a three-team trade, but that deal ended up being waived. He ended up returning to Sacramento in September of 2014. The Israeli basketball star rose to fame at Maccabi Tel Aviv, which happens to be Israel's most prominent basketball club. So far, Kaspi has averaged 5.9 points, 4.1 rebounds, and 1.2 assists per game over the 22 games this season. The Hebrew word of the day is brought to you by the University of Haifa, Hebrew Summer Ulpan, open to everyone. All right, now for our Hebrew word of the day. In many parts of the world, being deaf is considered a disability, but that's not necessarily a fair assumption to make. Most deaf people can do anything hearing people can except hear, which is why today's word is cheresh, which means deaf in Hebrew. A lot can be understood through body language, and oftentimes being cheresh allows a person to learn and understand humans in even more unique ways. Sign language is a language of its own, and here in Israel, most news 
channels have a person translating the news into signage. Actually, that was one of the first things that stood out to me when I moved here because being able to see that Kharesh people have support even on television really stands out. So just so you know, Israel uses two types of sign languages, one for Arabic and one for Hebrew. Now, being Kharesh isn't always about sound. Sometimes you meet people who have the ability to actually hear, but they don't know how to listen. So if you're looking for some tips on how to understand the people around you in more profound ways, it might be time to turn to some of your Kharesh friends for advice. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. ILTV's weather forecast is sponsored by Adopt a Safta, taking care of Israel's lonely Holocaust survivors. Tonight should be clear to partly cloudy with a low of 45 or 7 degrees Celsius. You can expect tomorrow to be partly cloudy but with a drop in temperatures. The high should be around 64 or 18 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.71 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.tv. Thanks for watching and see you next time.